turn and record. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our um, CEO Professional Development Series that we have today. I'm super excited um, to have you all here and our panelists as well. Um, and so my name is Christian Wells, and I am the CEO Professional Development Chair, and we're collaborating with the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Oh, and Liz, introduce yourself, please. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Ingrao. I serve as the CEO Professional Development Chair-elect along with Christian. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Maurice Whitsett. I serve as the Chair for the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Chair Committee. Good afternoon, everybody. Jaleesha Turner-Davis, she, hers pronouns, and I serve as Maurice's Chair-elect for the DEI Committee. Okay, so we're going to let Maurice go ahead and start to introduce our panelists and Go from there. Yes, once again, good afternoon, everybody. It is great to serve as a moderator for this session. So I'm going to go down and list and introduce these great individuals that served on the panelists. First, we have Michael Cherry, who served as the Associate Director of Residence Life at George Mason. He used the he, him series of pronouns and has been in the field of higher education for 14 years. Currently served as the CEO Secretary, former Relive faculty, and has served on various committees within CEO and Akuo I. So welcome, Michael. Next, we have Chris Reese. He has he uses a he him series of pronouns, served as a staff and community development coordinator at Georgia Tech, has served in housing for 15 years, and was our past chair for the DEI committee for CEO. Next, we have Naomi Saxon, who served as the assistant director for residence education. She uses the he or her series of pronouns, currently at Georgia Southern University Armstrong campus has been in higher ed for eight years, five years post-bachelor slash RA, three years post-masters. And accolades is she was on the 2023 um, Relive um, participant. So welcome to our panelists. We're going to get started. We would love to hear your insight. Um, Dr. Wells, you're going to post a um, question in the chat, or do you want me to? Uh, you said post a question in the chat. Yes. Yeah. If you can, that'd be great. Okay, great. <laughs> all right. So the first question is, can you all talk about your career journeys and how you were able to navigate it based on your specific identity while working in Southern states? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so I have always lived in um, Southern states. I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. Um, I went to the University of West Georgia as an RA. Um, and through that experience, I kind of moved through like OPE to get to UCA, which is in central Arkansas. Um, if you haven't been to Arkansas, that's okay. Um, but um, it has great things there too. Um, while I was there actually in 2020, everyone's favorite year, um, I actually came out a few different times um, as I was going through my kind of gender transition. Um, and so I was leaning more towards that gender non-conforming. And then by like the August range, I just came out as a transgender woman. Um, and so I did that in Arkansas. Um, which was very interesting. Um, luckily, I was in Conway, Arkansas, which was like really close to Little Rock. So I was able to kind of get the medical help that I needed um, at that time, which was very nice. And my team there was very supportive. I had a great um, supervisor who kind of helped me throughout that time period and like made sure people were respecting me and giving me everything that I needed during that time as well. Um, after that, I moved to Georgia Southern and started at Yes, UCA. Um, started at um, the Statesboro campus and determined that I needed more of a community like myself. Um, and so I was able to transition to the Savannah campus, which was very nice. And during that time, um, I got my name legally changed and it was just all a lot. Um, so while also moving through my um, career journey, I was also trying to just figure out who I was. Um, but luckily, just being from the South, it's really no stranger in the trials and tribulations I had while growing up have really prepared me for where we are now with everything that's changing um, throughout the nation, but especially here in the South. Um, I don't feel like I've been like gut punched as hard just because of everything that I've been through. Um, so I, that's who I am and kind of where I got to sit in front of you today. Thank you, Naomi. I can go next. Um, hello again, Chris Ruiz. So I um, also grew up in Southern states in a different type of South though. 
Um, people don't usually consider Texas a part of the South in the way that um, we are over here, but it is very conservative and very, um, uh, very challenging to um, grow up gay. And so I didn't really grow up gay um, in Texas. Um, I pretty much um, concealed my identity um, until I went to college. Um, and a lot of that was due to just the fact that people didn't really talk about it in the city that I grew up in. Um, there wasn't really a lot of visibility um, for queer and gay people in Amarillo, Texas. Um, and even when I go back to the city, um, that still kind of rings true. Um, and so that was something that um, I didn't really experience through my um, formative years. Um, it was more towards the early adult part of my life when um, I did come out um, and then when I did start to live um, authentically. Um, but even still, uh, I was bullied. Um, I lived in the residence halls at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, um, which is also a pretty conservative city. Um, and I, I found myself being bullied by other folks that lived in the hall with me. Um, but luckily I had um, support from the RA and from the um, hall director at the time to um, just give me the resources that I need and to just keep me connected um, to um, being a student leader. And so I think that really kind of catapulted me into working in higher education because um, I recognize that there is a need to provide those spaces for our students, um, especially those that are kind of sitting in different marginalized identity spaces. And so for me, um, that was something that really propelled me to where I am today. Um, but I will say that it hasn't always been as easy. Um, I know I've tended to stay looking at institutions in the South, um, but as we can see, a lot of the Southern states are um, starting to create more legislation to um, combat kind of the ability to live authentically. And so that had always been a consideration for me when I was looking at institutions and when I was applying for jobs, um, which is part of the reason why I've stayed in my position, or I've stayed at Georgia Tech for so long living in Atlanta, um, is because Atlanta is a larger city. Um, there's a lot more opportunities to um, connect with other um, queer and um, trans and gay individuals. And I um, really needed that for my community and being able to feel um, the support that I need to be successful. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so uh, similar to to Naomi and Chris, grew up in the in the South as well. From from Tennessee originally, did my undergrad uh, in Tennessee and in Florida for for my master's degree at, at Florida State and. <clears throat> pretty much all of my career has been in the Southeast. And I think in, in navigating the career specific to in relation to to my my own identity as a as a gay male, it's been interesting because I didn't come to that own understanding in, in my own life until uh, I was already into my career. I was into my second position when when I was starting to accept that identity for myself and was already at my second full time uh, institution at, the, at that point as well. Um, and it was in a rural area. It was in a place where there wasn't a whole lot of visible community outside of the institution. And the institution was doing some things to, to create that. Um, and that's one of the reasons uh, where I was in life and what I was comfortable with from in terms of my own family dynamic. Uh, and that kind of thing is what, what led to me coming out. But um, it also gave me the opportunity on that campus to really dive in and get involved and kind of gave a little bit of purpose behind it outside of just my own experiences, which I think was a useful way to, to find community, 
without some of the fear of like walking into spaces that felt un uncomfortable or unknown uh, as it might have been maybe in in say a, a larger city even um, and then transition to to a large city in the northeast and, and found a lot of more visible community there, but it felt very similar to communities in the South, which was kind of interesting. It was still, um, I think the, the queer and LGBTQ plus community absolutely has its own divides and its own challenges. And that was true even in large cities, even though I went there going like, oh, look at this great, I'm gonna have this super out community and it's gonna be amazing. Uh, and, and in a lot of ways it was, and, and in others it was the same as it is anywhere, right? We're humans and, and that doesn't change necessarily uh, depending on where you live. Uh, and then came back to the South. And, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of privileges that I have in my identities that I recognize. And, and when I came out, I was independent and had my own income and, and all of those kinds of things. But um, I think my identity also helped push me away and out of the nest, so to speak. So I've not lived closer to home than six hours, I think, since I left undergrad after going to a school 18 miles from my house door to door. Um, so I think my identity helped me push that way and become more comfortable being outside of that, um, that sphere. So I think that's definitely impacted my own, my career kind of journey and where I've chosen to go. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, the next question that we have is how has recent state and federal laws about diversity, equity, inclusion affected you as a higher ed professional? I can, I can go ahead and start us off. Um, so I, I think, as I mentioned, you know, I've, I've definitely have a lot of privileges in that I'm a white cis male. And so I think those help protect me in a lot of ways. Um, in a lot of spaces, I can be straight passing if I choose to be as well. If I, if my partner's with me, if I don't speak about my partner, uh, and so when when thinking about these laws and and where I can feel comfortable, I recognize and own those identities. Uh, if it makes it easier to be in spaces where I'm not necessarily um, identified in in kind of a public way uh, as maybe some others in the community are. And so I recognize those privileges, but it it has made me definitely think and pause in a lot of ways. So I'm in the DC area now uh, and the thinking about in, in Virginia, thankfully we've not had some of the legislation, but we've had some executive orders in terms of what we can do on our campuses uh, as a state institution. But it definitely makes me think of like, what are the worst case scenarios, right? Of how do I protect my myself if we get to, you know, I I I don't want to be all doom and gloom, but if if we got to something even remotely like a Handmaid's Tale kind of experience, and we're I think hopefully a long way away from that, but that's where my mind naturally goes is what is the absolute worst? And the more I've come out, the more I've done things like this panel or joined lists at my alma mater or my current institution as as an out professional and putting uh you know Naomi Naomi in the background has. Uh, a couple of, of identifying flags back there that are very visible. And so like people know and, you know, that uh, and I live with my partner. And so what does that look like um, of you can't really go back in the closet after that. And so if it does become harder, you do start to be ostracized for those identities. Uh, it's definitely something that's been in the back of my mind and, and makes choosing where I go a little bit different. I didn't choose in the, well, the answer to the last question, but I have colleagues that I would love to work with that uh, had worked at, at religiously based institutions and and after they found out this was several years ago in my career and they're like oh like you know I didn't realize you'd come out etc and otherwise I wouldn't have recruited you because you would not be comfortable on this campus and I don't want you to come to some place that is not welcoming and affirming to you um, and so I really appreciated that colleague that mentor for for taking that mindset um, when we had connected. And so I think about that now where, uh, when I'm looking at places or future opportunities, when I came to Mason, uh, being a, a diverse campus that supports queer students is, is uh, helpful and, and definitely a safer place to be, but it also then drives me to, to find ways on the campus to how do I support that both in our profession and, and on my own school. So personally, it definitely makes me more wary and, and recognize my privileges a little more and then figure out like, what can I do to advocate and, and create spaces for folks that may not have those same privileges? Uh, 
Um, for me, I think it's really hard just because it continuously feels like with every step forward, there's always somebody trying to like pull us back. Um, and I think with that, it comes like there's no sense of normalcy and it makes it feel like it's this taboo thing that can't be spoken about. And depending on where you are, some of those um, kind of laws are working to be passed. Um, so it's really just kind of like disheartening to see. Um, here at Georgia Southern University, um, administration has suspended um, various LGBTQIA plus um, initiatives, which was like, you know, it happened very like silently. Um, but our students, of course, saw those things and they were able to do a peaceful protest, um, which was actually really like nice to see. It happened on both of our campuses. Um, and we even had like staff there that was like supporting them and making sure they had what they needed um, during that time. Um, but that is the kind of thing that brings back hope for me that we will be able to kind of get to a, a more normal type of place of like this thing is not that different. It really, you don't have to do all of these like laws and things to kind of like create this barrier um, to make it feel like people can't be themselves. Um, I think for me, um, I have just been trying to stay with showing who I am. So like Michael Cherry pointed out, I do have my flags here um, that are showing who I am. When you walk into this office, you know who I am. I have drag queens pictures in my office. I have all kinds of things that just showcase like, this is who I am. I'm really not going anywhere. Um, and so luckily I work at a place where I feel like I can do that. Um, kind of like Chris said, I have stayed here at Georgia Southern because I know that the support that I have is, it feels unwavering, especially here in university housing. Um, so that is kind of where I am with it. I try to just um, kind of talk to my people and really focus in on me because it is very hard just kind of seeing like every day something else it feels like it's popping up. Yeah, I definitely want to echo kind of like that aspect of things being hard um, and challenging um, just because everything has been shifting so quickly. And I think that a lot of what I've seen in my work is that institutions are trying to get in front of it um, in a way that can potentially be harmful um, without them really recognizing that. And, um, I, and I, it was interesting that um, Michael said earlier, you know, like I can't really go back into the closet. Um, and and it kind of feels like in some spaces we're kind of being asked to go back in the closet. Um, and like one of the things that comes to mind for me, um, so my position is a little bit more unique than what I've done in the past um, because I do a lot more of our diversity, equity and inclusion programming, um, training um, and support and collaboration with other offices. And so like my position is really focused in on that. Um, and we had created a working title for my position that was um, the belonging and inclusion coordinator. Um, like uh, for, at first it was a DEI coordinator and then it was like the belonging and inclusion coordinator. And then I was told, okay, maybe we shouldn't even have that in your title. So we're just going to have it be staff and community development coordinator. And so like, I've been having to like go through these different variations of like a positional title change um, just to um, combat um, and ensure that I'm able to do what I need to do for our students because we know that it's an important work to do in order to retain, in order to support. And so that in a way has kind of felt like I've been told, you know, you can't be who you are um, in kind of a different way. Um, I, I've had conversations with colleagues about fearing that they're gonna lose their jobs. Um, and the LGBTQIA centers um, are the ones that are getting hit way harder in some instances um, because all of these legislative um, actions are aimed clearly at the LGBTQ communities. Um, and they're, they're able to kind of um, roll in 
um, race is a part of that um, as a way to, to continue to kind of create like those barriers for marginalized individuals. And so I know for me, like, I, I have like ups and downs, like in terms of like attitude with the work, um, because it can be very heavy to be told, not necessarily from your own institutions, but from like the people that you're trying to represent and support that they don't need your support um, or that they um, don't want to support the students that are in their state funded institutions. And so it's really interesting. And um, I, I, of course, have had a lot of things in my life that have created a resilience for that, um, for me to be able to bounce back. Um, but it can be challenging. Um, and there's still more to come. It's not as though everything has just ceased um, at this point. And so I'm just trying my best to make sure that whatever programs I'm creating for my students, um, whatever training and conversations I'm having with the hall directors and with the assistant directors um, is to really just let them know that I'm there to support them. I'm there to kind of be their fact finder um, and give them um, the resources so that way they can truly help um, their students feel comfortable in the halls. Thank you all. You all talked a lot about the support that you all have from your current cities that you all are in to the universities. And that's a good segue to this next question. So what type of supports have you received throughout your career journey? I would say that my supervisor has always been um, someone that I've been able to turn to, to, to feel support. Um, and um, I was lucky that I've been able to be supervised by lots of different um, types of people. Um, um, I've had um, queer supervisors before. Um, I've had um, Black women supervisors before. I've had lesbian supervisors before. So like I've had kind of those folks who can, un who understand the struggle and that I'm able to like go into the office and be like, okay, so this happened today um, and I need to process it with someone. Like I just need to, to kind of either one, check my petty or two, like under, <laughs> like, okay, like let's, let's see if this was like a, a real micro here that happened. Um, and, and I've really appreciated that. Um, I think they've also like pushed me towards getting involved in things um, that do bring me joy. And so like, I feel like I have pretty much like, I'm, I've am i been a part of Atlanta Pride before. I've walked in the parade, like I <laughs> carry the flag, you know, like I, I'm pretty much a, a card carrying gay here. Like, <laughs> um, so like I. Well done. He froze. Um, so okay. like I've had supervisors that help to support that. <laughs> Chris, we you froze a little bit. Um can you share the light, the tail end of what you were talking about? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was just saying, you know, I um am a card carrying gay. Yes. I <laughs> I uh essentially um I want to find that community um, and my supervisors have helped me in figuring that out and um, supporting me in being able to do those things. And so for me, um, the support looks like community, um, building that community. Thank you. I think uh, for for me, the support very much on that personal side, similar to to Chris, has has been uh, helpful and and there from from all of my supervisors. Even even going back probably before I was out, I think some of them may have indicated or known just based off of behaviors or things that that I was demonstrating. Uh, and so I think, and it didn't change when when I came out uh, in the professional workspace and uh th the way that kind of showed up in a space was in a team builder at a grad retreat ironically on a christian camp uh in the middle of mississippi 
Um, so, but, but the, the space and, and the people in the space, like it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. Like whether people knew or not, uh, you know, it, it didn't change the reaction. And so I appreciate that, you know, the, the reactions from, from folks on that team at the time and, uh, and, and how that, that goes. And, and fortunately I've always had supervisors that I've not had to educate in any way, or, uh, that asked me about, uh, my partner, as much as they would any anyone who's not identified in the, in the queer community, uh, and so that's I've been very fortunate in that, and I recognize that. And so uh, you know, I, I think for for me as a supervisor, for others as a supervisor, recognizing that that that's important, and then when that is shared and and saying like you know, uh, recognizing how that might look different uh, given given the, the the different the differences between kind of straight and and queer relationships. Uh, but I think it's also to, similar to what Chris was saying, encouraging and supporting getting involved in spaces that uh, that are affirming. And so uh, when I was at uh, the University of Mississippi, which is where I was when I came out, uh, that campus in a lot of ways was trying to build up what it did to support students around diversity um, and inclusion. And, and particularly, uh, I was in, I don't even know, I can't even remember if I was was offered the opportunity or if somehow I just got connected to it, but uh, ended up working with both our first kind of uh, uh, coming out day, national coming out day celebrations on the campus through through the, the cultural center uh, on campus, as well as uh, the the first kind of rounds of what what, uh, what we called at the time pride camp. And I'm not sure if they still do it or not, but uh, which was a, the intent was a to be a pre-orientation space for queer uh, students coming to campus because we knew a lot of them would come to campus and would come out on campus, but then have to hide those identities whenever they went home. And we had a lot of conversations about what does that look like? Because they can't come early without explaining to mom and dad, why am I coming a week early? So how do we do this after move in and, and orientation and some of those types of things? And I was a part of that for our, our department, our housing department. And was in those spaces and was never challenged or asked, hey, why are you spending time facilitating events for for the the, the culture the multicultural center or why are you asking for money for some of those those spaces? And our our CHO was super supportive and of that center as a whole because it did not just LGBTQ plus student support, but uh, students of of color and, and pretty much all marginalized identities were uh kind of supported by that one office. And uh, so it really allowed me to kind of build my own skills and, and explore my identity more in, in that space while serving students. And, um, you know, since, since then, it's, a, it's about uh, finding ways to, uh, to kind of support on that, that personal end, which, which I appreciate of, you know, can, we, can partners join, partners that aren't married, uh, can, can they join in, in housing that is provided by the, the institution and how do we adjust and change our language and convince, you know, the powers that be general counsels or whoever to adjust those types of things. And, and I've been very fortunate that I've had all of those uh, opportunities and, and elements provided for me and, and where, where I've been able to advocate, I've found support from supervisors. And so fortunately on that, that personal level, it's, it's been really good. Thank you. Um, for me, this is probably one of my favorite questions. Um, I have been able to be supported by many, many people throughout my career, both personally and professionally. Most of them, or a lot of them are on the screen. So thank you to all of you for even coming here today. Um, but I'm what a lot of people call a character. <laughs> um, it was mentioned before, but I am not someone that can walk into a space and you not see um, a, a little bit about me, um, so to speak. You don't know everything about me when I walk into a room, but you do know, and you can probably tell I'm very different than a lot of other people. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I have been able to be myself in many spaces that I've worked at, and I'm very grateful for that. Not everyone has that um, experience or even that opportunity to so. Um, I mentioned I started my transition at UCA and I had an amazing supervisor, um, Benita Fricks, who was able to support me. She was a Black lesbian woman. Um, and so I truly appreciate her for everything she was able to give me. Um, 
just throughout that time, making sure other people were supporting me. I know I was very different than what a lot of people had seen in Arkansas, you know, in come on, Dr. Vanita, in 2020. Um, so I was very grateful to have that experience. In um, 2023, I mentioned, or it was mentioned that I did get to go to Relive. Um, and so that gave me a very supportive community, a cohort of amazing people um, who I'm able to turn to and ask questions. Um, and I just felt very included, which is not something that um, I'm always able to feel because when I walk I, everywhere I go, I'm most likely the only Black transgender woman. Um, and that, you know, is just something I'm used to at this point. Um, but so even though other people do not look like me, I still felt very included within that space. Um, and then just something I truly want to highlight in this question, Georgia Southern University Housing has been the most supportive workplace I could have ever asked for um, during this time. Granted, it's the only one I've worked at professionally since post-grad, but that doesn't matter. Um, allowing me to just be who I am, um, come and share who I am with students and staff. My first training ever, um, I got to do a um, presentation that I call what's the LGBT, um, T like T-E-A, I know, very cute. Um, and so like just even then coming in, being able to share just who I am, um, and so I want to say thank you. Uh, and then one of my favorite stories is that, like I said, in 2022, I changed my name legally. Um, and though I'm not very far from my family, um, at the time I was two and a half hours away, two hours away. Um, I just remember Meg, my director, Megan Hines, if any of, <laughs> if any of you know her, um, she just comes up to me after I was telling everybody like, hey, this thing is happening. If you don't know, the process to change your name in Georgia is wild. It's a little ridiculous. You got to put in the newspaper. Who's even reading that? Um, all these things. Um, and so she was like, hey, can I come to court with you? Um, and I was like, that would be so lovely. So both Meg, my direct supervisor, Katie, um, and one of my peers, Kel, um, just came with me to court. We played hangman on piece of paper, passing it down. Um, that's one of my favorite stories to tell because it's always gonna be with me. That is something that is gonna be monumental in my life. And it just goes to show like the support came out of the office. So not only have I had the opportunity to do a lot of different things that I would not think that I could do, um, but they also are there personally for me too, which I think is very important. Thank you all so much. Um, we're gonna keep going with this supportive area. So I had to do a pivot on these question lists. How have you supported? So let's turn the tables. How have you supported and or educated students regarding your identity? I mean, I for me, um, I w took advantage of some opportunities um, to um, facilitate kind of our safe space training on campus. Um, and so um, in working with that office, like I was able to um, put myself in spaces where I was talking not only students, but also the faculty members um, who do have a little bit more of an impact on kind of like the students experience um because they spend a good majority of their time in classes um and so for me um it was about finding a space where i could educate um kind of in a formal capacity um because i wanted to one have that experience but two um because of the information that was being provided um was really useful and it was it could translate across different um, identities. Um, so for me, that's kind of a way that I've supported. Um, in addition to that, like now um, in my role, like I'm able to create programming and build opportunities for offices to come into the halls um, to kind of give students that opportunity to learn from each other, um, but then also to celebrate each other, um, which I think is really important um, for um, giving those students that community feeling. Um, so that's kind of how I've um, worked to kind of support um, and educate um, students. Um, I've also in my career have had um, to navigate, of course, um, policies that um, weren't as supportive 
um, to um, individuals living in the residence hall. And so um, at one point, like we didn't have an gender, gender inclusive housing option at Georgia Tech. Um, and pr of course, prior to us putting something in place, we had um, students who identified as transgender. And so in being able to support those students, um, get them connected to the resources for them to be successful, we also had to um, educate the community and we had to ensure that um, those students living in those spaces felt safe, um, even if they weren't necessarily built that way for them. Um, we had to um, figure something out. Um, but then once we were able to create like a true gender inclusive housing option, um, that gave us an opportunity to really think, how do we train the RAs? How are we training um, the the hall director staff in those communities, how are we training our assignment staff to understand um, what this means um, so that there's not a misgendering happening um, in any communication or things like that. And so that I think that has also been something that um, I've had a hand in um, and have helped to make sure we're taken care of in the halls. Um. For me, I, like I said, was able to do that LGBT presentation, um, but not only at that time, but I've been doing it for student staff members, both at UCA and here, um, which has been very nice because at that time, um, I get to share who I am and a piece of me with those students, let them know like who I am and why I'm there. Um, but also those conversations or that presentation gets to open up to different conversations that I get to have with students, which is very nice. Um, I thrive on connecting with peers and students. Um, and so allowing them the space to ask me questions within reason. Um, but through that, I've been able to connect with um, some different peers at the time or different students kind of um, for them to they wanted to talk to me kind of about how I got where I was um, and helping them move through where they would like to be, um, which have led, you know, into conversations with tears. I'm not the best with tears, um, <laughs> but I try to make sure that I'm there to give them that support because I know how hard it is. Um, I know what that's like um, to kind of feel like you're in this wavering place of like not knowing who you are, which is very hard because you think like I'm in my 20s. I should know who I am, right? Like I grew up my whole life being in this body. Don't I know who I am? Um, so I think one of my favorite memories is just being able to connect with another um, Black transgender female. Um, she was one of my residents while I was an RD, um, she did not have the best reputation. She was very rude to other staff members. Um, and so, but never to me. I was like, okay, a win is a win. Um, and so we would connect. Um, I took some time to like, I was like, hey, can you come by my office? Let's talk about these things. Um, and we were able to talk about like, the things that were happening, but also like, tell me about you and why like you're here. Do you know that this is kind of like the reputation you're leaving? Like, what what does that look like for you? And um, it turned into more of like why she felt like she needed to be defensive, um, what other people deemed as rude. And so we talked through that of like, look, I know that it's very hard being in college are very different, but you know, there is, that glimmer of hope. There are things that can get you out of this and you don't have to be um, what you are deeming as defensive and other people may see as a little rude. Um, so we were able to talk through that. And so after that initial conversation and interaction, we were able to bond over just different things and each other's successes. Um, she's off in nursing school now. Um, we talked about when I came up um, and got this assistant director position and she was like, okay, we're about to make waves. I'm like, that's right. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just really nice to see another fellow Black transgender woman, especially in the collegiate setting, because again, there's, you know, not many, many of us. Um, and so it just reminded me like, this is what I do this for. Um, and so not only for myself, but for my students too, that want to um, just work through who they are. I think it's similar to, to what folks have already shared, finding those formal formal ways like I've shared in a couple of the other answers and uh, on different campuses, whether it's through safe zone trainings or or events and activities and, and finding ways to, to work through those. 
uh, and presenting during student staff training, things like that. Uh, but I think for me, it's also been important in kind of the individual one-on-one -on -one settings of once I once I did you know enter into the, the the relationship that I'm in now, speaking transparently about that with students. And and treating it as if, as I've seen all of my other, you know, straight peers talk about their families and and their experiences, and and so that it it wasn't like a hey, like I'm I'm you know promoting this for any particular any specific reason, but I know in the back of my head if we talk about it, if we're visible in a way with with students, whether they're where whatever they identify as, it it begins to normalize that in their experience for them. And and hopefully uh, either opens the door for questions or if they're if they react negatively, uh, then then maybe potentially offer, offer, offer opening an opportunity to challenge. And then I think as well as a supervisor, when I was publicly out, I was at the point that I was supervising staff, and so challenging some of our our uh, our staff uh, or our students around some of their behaviors and, and calling it out when they were engaging in in a microaggression and that kind of thing and supporting staff who were who were better at doing that than I was and this is something I didn't say earlier that I appreciated uh, as well from a support standpoint is that there were queer individuals Vanita actually being one of them uh, on my campus at the time who were were out and proud in, in their own ways and and paving the the groundwork so to speak with the students in our department and, and other staff and so learning from them and and following their lead on things as well and then as as someone with positional authority supporting those individuals in that case so um yeah so I think that that's Kind of for me, where where I doing it on that that one on one uh, level, I think is also important to recognize as well. Thank y'all so much for talking about the support. Now, I think the most important thing we need to talk about are those challenges. So the next question is, what challenges have you faced or overcome related to your identity? Um. I had a hard time thinking of an answer to this question because professionally, I um, don't believe I have had to face a lot of challenges outside of the like common worry of just being different, being misgendered, um, for feeling like I'm being judged just walking into a space. Um, most of my challenges are internal, um, which I have to face on a daily basis. Um, the two that come to mind are feeling just so very different um, and alone in a room. Um, and then the physical attributions that I believe lead to or uh, lead people to my misgendering. So like, I hate my voice um, and like just all kind of different things. Um, and when feeling alone in a room, um, like I am on a leadership team of what was like six or seven, um, only black individual, only like, outward facing LGBT person. Um, and I say outward facing, meaning like when you look at me, I like I said, I'm very different. Um, and so I've had to do like a lot of like thinking within myself, talking to people that support me about like what that looks like. And so what I've had to like come to understand is it's okay to be different in a room. Um, sometimes that difference does feel a little like lo aloneness, loneliness, but um, I have to remember why I'm in that space. So even today, I was very like nervous. I knew that I was um, the baby of the panel. Um, like I, I just know, like I didn't, I didn't know what I was able to bring to this. I, I didn't, like I said just now, like I don't feel like I've had many challenges in the workplace, um, but I know that. I am a Black transgender woman that most people do not see on a daily basis. Um, I had that experience of transitioning while also showing up at work and, you know, one day I'm dressing like this and the next day I'm dressing like this. And so determining what that looks like um, at work. So um, I've just been able to put myself into those places, even being here on the assistant director level um, and just being able to showcase like, you can do this too, to all of my students that are walking by that see me. Um, and whether you, you know, can believe it or not, I'm here, baby. Um, and so even on my worst days, um, I'm feeling like, the, I don't know, like, 
this just doesn't feel like it. Um, I get to go home to an amazing partner who lifts me up. I get to call up my family and friends who keep me grounded. Like I, I know that even on my worst, there are people who are there to support me to when I'm feeling better. Um, so for me, the challenges aren't necessarily things coming to me. It is more of like the things that I am putting out there and just determining like, okay, I know what I bring here. So all these other things don't matter. I, I think interesting and, and Naomi, I appreciate you being your authentic self as well and meeting you at Rely and that kind of a thing. Cause you know, that, that I think is a challenge that, that I know that I don't have because of those other identities that I mentioned earlier that are, are uh, dominant in, in a lot of ways and in, in terms of being cisgendered and, and male and white and those kinds of things. And so I also had a similar reaction of like, I've had all that support that we talked about earlier and it's been really good in the workplace. Uh, but I think personally, some of the, the challenges outside of the workplace are unique for LGBTQ individuals in the Southeast. Uh, and and I, I say this a lot to, to folks and some of the folks on the call probably heard me say this, like when I think about where I'm going, not only do I have to think about like from a safety and what are the laws in the state and all of that, but also are there things that meet what I'm interested in? And I recognize now that I'm in, I ha, I've, my partner and I have been together for five years and you know, I don't anticipate that going anywhere. Um, so, you know, we're in a really good place. And, uh, but I, I do know that when I came out, that was a huge fear for me is being in a small town that was a, basically doubled in size when school was in, in the academic year and recognizing that, that that community in that space for, for me as a gay male was students, mm, probably a little off limits, shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, looking to socialize externally with that group of people, right? Or were elder uh, queer individuals that were either already in relationships or weren't at the stage of life that I was at. And, and so that influenced where I could, where I was interested in going as I was looking to move on from that position and move up to. And, and so that becomes harder in those communities when you're not partnered. And that's a challenge that's individual to everyone. Do you want to partner? Do you not want to partner socially? What does that look like as far as the types of uh, community spaces you want to be in uh, and, and what's offered and available in, in those spaces? Um, and, and Oxford was, was great in a lot of ways for that. There were occasional nighttime spaces that you could go out and socialize in but students also went there. Um, and so that's always a hesitation with us in, in the housing field and in higher ed in general. And so so that was probably my biggest challenge because I had all the the work support. And then for me, it was, it was how do I engage in this outside of work and, and the challenge there? Yeah, so um, thanks both of y'all for sharing because like a lot of what I've experienced kind of is all of those things. Um, and it's interesting because for LGBTQIA plus individuals, there are not a lot of spaces for them. And so for those of us that work in higher ed um, and maybe working in larger cities or even in smaller towns, like you're still gonna run into folks um, because there's just not a lot of spaces for them to um, be themselves and be authentic. And, um, and that was something that I also experienced early on in my career. It was kind of like a challenge of uh, me ex even exploring my own identity in a new city, um, but then also, you know, running into students at like the local gay bar um, and having to ensure that I was keeping my distance and being professional in those situations. Um, and so I know that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, but the other piece was just kind of feeling isolated and disconnected in like a housing organization. Um, so like my identity, um, I have two uh, marginalized identities um, and one of them is not very prevalent in um, this part of the United States, um, unless you go to South Florida. Um, and so like a lot of times uh, my Latin identity, my, my Mexican identity, I was kind of feeling disconnected. Um, and then with compounded with my queer identity, um, I just felt like nobody really understood me. Um, and 
didn't really get my experience or um, how I would approach the work. And so like, I really had to um, push myself to share what that looked like and share how like I um, show up um, as a queer Latin professional um, because there are lots of things that I picked up from my family that I picked up from supervisors, um, but it was hard for me at the beginning to really lean into those identities um, because I just didn't have a connecting point with people. And so like I had to, I had to force myself to create the connections. It wasn't kind of the other way around. Um, and so that was kind of off putting at the very beginning. Um, but like, as I've matured and developed, um, like I understood the importance of being authentic and being, um, open about who I am in all spaces that I'm in, um, instead of having to like code switch in different scenarios. Well, thank you all so very much for just sharing our story. Um, I know we're about to come close to time, so I definitely want to open up the floor for any members that have any questions or any thoughts, please share them. There's been some great insights so far, so let's hear from the audience. Oh. No questions? Okay, friends, well, yes. All right, so we did have something. How do you manage the feelings of imposter syndrome associated with your roles given the criticism from the world? I think for me, it's like just talking, talking to people about it um, and really staying informed on what's going on. So that way um, I can at least form an opinion on something. And so um, a lot of times I'm having conversations with either my colleagues or with my supervisor or even like close friends um, to just get a sense of like, am, is the work that I'm doing really making a difference and helping to um, utilize them as kind of like that um, feedback has been helpful, um, but also like, ensuring that I'm staying knowledgeable is even more helpful. I think um, that kind of relates back to what I said earlier about just remembering what you bring to the space. Um, I had these very similar feelings um, kind of earlier and we know that, um, you know, there's always things being thrown around um, online. So I've had my run-ins with um, social media and just kind of like where the things can take it. Um, and one thing that I will say is like understanding that anything goes on social media. Um, and that's honestly where we get a lot of our information. That's where we get a lot of everything. Um, the criticism comes mostly probably from social media um, and just all the things that you're seeing. And so you start to internalize it a bit. Um, and you have to understand that there's like this line between your life and what's on social media. Um, and so even with my own um, sister, like we, we recently kind of had a little like difference of opinion, I guess, um, that I took very personally, but um, she had like, she had her view. I had my own view about what it is that the post was saying. And so it was just um, something that we had to work through. But, and so I even within myself started to internalize it and feel like, okay, well, does my own sister support me? Um, and so, you know, that was something I had to work through within myself, but 
within that, I remember I had to take that step back and everyone deserves to have their opinion, share what they want. I get to be who I am. She gets to be who she is. And we still get to come together um, to determine what our relationship is and the values that we share but for each other, um, between each other, and just kind of keep that separate. So I would say um, just remembering what you bring, remembering that it's okay for other people to have their opinions, um, do not, um, which is hard, but don't super internalize it. Um, and if you have those moments, share them um, with those individuals, connect, because you get to understand more. So I came to that understanding with my own sister of like, hey, okay, I get what you're posting and it doesn't have anything to do, of course, with me. It's just a matter of your values and where they lay and this is who I am and that's okay. Um, so. Um, I'm not even gonna try to follow that. That was that was excellent. Thank you, Naomi. All right. Do you have any more questions? I think we can take one more question because I know we're at time. Naomi, Michael, Chris, thank you all so much for sharing your stories. It was greatly appreciated. Just honestly holding a space and just being authentic. Um, thank you all to the Professional Development Committee for CEO. It was great that you all put this space together. It's always a joy to um, collaborate with you all. So I think the panel, like the moderator, years the floor. So Dr. Wells, if you have any further instructions. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was truly um, wonderful to have this conversation today. And thank you all for sharing your personal um, and professional you know, lives with us today. Um, so I am going to stop the recording.